Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Inspinar. Inspinar is a crisp and powerful 30-minute conversation designed to empower us all with the roadmap for a more peaceful and productive life. I'm your host, Dr. Nithi Gupta. My guest today is Dr. Hala Sabri. Dr. Sabri is an emergency medicine physician who is most well known for finding Physician Moms Group, the largest physician, women physician support group in the world. And I am a proud member of that group myself. Since building her community, she started helping other companies build an audience around their products and services as a community engagement consultant. Dr. Sabri has mentored numerous women over the last decade. She has now started a formal coaching practice that aims to support high-earning women in male-dominated fields, women who struggle with thoughts of wanting to quit due to loneliness, struggles with confidence, and resentment of the sacrifices they had to make to have a successful, lucrative career. Dr. Sabri's mission is to support all women at every level so that they can continue to fight the gender inequity that exists in the world. Dr. Sabri, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So share your story with us, Dr. Sabri. What led to the foundation of Physician Mother Group, one of the largest women physician support groups in the world? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I really didn't know what I was building when I, when I built it, um, there, I think that's where a lot of good ideas come from. It's just like more of like fulfilling a need that maybe you have, or that you see in the world and, um, realizing that other people have that need as well. Um, and so my needs at that time were, you know, I was, you know, really comfortable with being a physician because I was trained to do that. There was school and we had mentors, but when it started learning how, you know, having, having to learn how to like grow a family and all that stuff. I didn't really have that same instruction. And I mean, now I, I know there's no such thing as instruction on like mom university or, you know, how to, you know, live successfully, but I wasn't really realizing that, you know, I was missing that type of mentorship. You know, most of the doctors, you know, when you look at the numbers are men and, uh, most of them that were in my circle at the time didn't have, um, partners, whether they were men or women that were working, they, they were the breadwinner. And so it was really interesting. Um, they had a lot of solutions for me, but all the solutions were not like available to me because I work, you know, they're like, you know, all of their solutions required me not to work. And I wanted to stay in the field, you know? Um, and so I was really struggling. And so I just started this group to have those conversations. Um, and then the group has become so much more, you know, but that's where it really started. It really wasn't like this grand, I mean, people think I'm like brilliant and I, and I am brilliant, but I didn't really feel brilliant the day I started it. I was really looking, you know, just to have somebody tell me what to do, like mentorship, like really, what do I do next? Being the founder and being one of the administrators of Physician Mothers Group, comes with massive responsibility. I know PMG is not just another Facebook group for socializing. I know there are several serious issues that are discussed there that come up um, in different posts and they are often resolved, which require the admins to work behind the scenes. So what has this experience been like for you? How does it feel that so many people look up to you for support and guidance? How do you navigate that situation? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I'm so glad you're bringing up this question because there are, there is a group of us, you know, it's not just me, it's, you know, 23 of us. Um, and all of the women who run Physician Moms Group are very diverse in their medical practice and their backgrounds and their ethnicities, their religion of practice, um, because we started realizing exactly what you said it isn't just a Facebook group. It's literally like everybody's lives, you know, and we get so focused in medicine of being so invested in our patients' lives. Um, and we kind of forget that like, 
we are patients as well, you know, and, um, and we're people too. And we're not always the people that are resources that sometimes we need the resource. Um, and so that kind of put us in a very like interesting position as admins, you know, because now we're the resource for people who are resources that need the resource. Right. And so it's like, you know, how do we support each other? And so I, what I love about the group is we have really like, you know, it's really heavy. Like some of the things that are um, handed to us or tasked to us or, you know, current events that happen are really heavy. And what I love is that we lean on each other. Like we have our own community of admins um, and support. And so I think that's really, really important. But before I developed that and these women developed that with me, um, man, I was, I was really burnt out because, you know, when you have a certain number of people, like when we talk in medicine and we talk about incidents, you know, um, we talk about like how many per hundred thousand, you know, we're at that, we we have a hundred thousand. So all these rare things or these things that you think you're never going to see, we see regularly, you know, because of the volume of people. And I made that mean just, it was kind of a really interesting awakening that I also think my job as a physician is to solve everybody's problems. And sometimes the best way to help with medicine is just to validate people, hear what they're saying, try to help them with resources. And sometimes we don't have the answers to everything. And I think that understanding that sometimes there are no answers um, yet, uh, I think was a big revelation for me because when I didn't realize that I kept trying to find answers and I kept trying to and do the impossible. You know what I mean? Like people would, you know, tag me in posts, like, what are we going to do about world hunger? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, if UNICEF hasn't figured that out, like, I don't know how I'm going to figure this out. Right. Or, you know, or firearms control or whatever it may be. And so I think when I started realizing like maybe my role here is to allow a venue for people to fr be frustrated and complain, just to allow them to do that. Right. Without making them feel bad or trying not to allow them to feel the the discomfort of trying to solve their problem and things like that. And I, and I truly think that every member in our group is so brilliant that she can solve her own problems. Just sometimes she needs to air it out and figure out what the problem is and what their resources are. Right. And I don't view the 23 of us as the go-to for that. I think the whole community is the go-to for that, you know? And so I, when I started kind of like decentralizing my role, like I started real, actually enjoying the role more and um, taking it less personally. <laughs> Sometimes I turn to physician mothers group as a source of therapy. Yeah. Like you said, it's, it's a platform for venting. Some conversations just need listeners. They don't need solutions. I'm so grateful to have a group like that uh, to help me navigate through tricky situations. So let's gear towards your coaching practice. Your coaching practice aims to support high earning women in male dominated fields. What are some of the common thing, themes, Dr. Sabri, that, that are coming across in your coaching practice, which are making these women contemplating quitting medicine altogether? Well, I coach um, women that are from all industries. Most of my clients happen to be doctors because that's where I'm more well known but I coach lawyers and dentists and pharmacists and engineers. Um, and the way that I kind of started getting into that is um, after I created Physician Moms Group, other industries had approached me, other women in those industries going, oh, do, is there a PMG for lawyers? Right? And I'm like, not yet, but we could build it, right? And so I would help support them in building that. And after doing it for like five different industries, I started realizing you know what? The problems that we think are so unique to physicians are not. It just, the words are different a little bit, but it's the same problems that the lawyers face, that the engineers face. And in fact, it's the same that any woman in a male dominated field um, is facing, you know, because we are the minority. Um, and so I started realizing that and I started kind of stopped. I, I, I stopped, I stopped having um, kind of what you're talking about, the venting, the venting helped me just for so long. And then I realized like, I'm not venting anymore. Like I'm, I'm very content with where I'm at. I'm not, I, I don't want to complain about my life anymore. I actually just want to create the life that I want to live. And 
I kind of call PMG and any support group. It's not just PMG, but really people go there for a survival mode, right? They go there when they have an actual problem, when, you know, or if they, or if they have some capacity to help some of somebody else with their problem, right? But usually it's very like problem based, right? And yeah, there is some celebrating. And of course, like there's some funny stuff and all of that, of course, right? Because we're dynamic people. But I think support groups really is, you know, really highlighting that support part. I think at some point I stopped thinking I was a victim and I stopped thinking that, I mean, I will always need support, but I, I stopped thinking I needed support, right? Like wanting support and needing support are a little bit different. Right. And so when I started making those changes, I kind of felt like, oh my God, who am I? Like, what, what do I do now with PMG? Like, since it's not serving me in the same way, it is serving me. I still go to there. I still post, I still do all the things. And of course I admin it, but I wanted more. I wanted to start building the life I wanted, which is different than a support group. It's more of a thriving type of mindset. And that's when I started kind of getting into coaching as a client and I loved coaching so much. And I, my coach would hear me in ways that I just never heard other people talk or heard myself talk. And I was like, well, I want to learn this skill just to have it for like, when I go to the hospital and I'm talking to patients or when I'm dealing with PMG members or like, just, it's a good life skill to have, you know? And so I was like, oh, you know, I just really want to learn it. So I, I went and got a coaching certification. Um, and then through that, you know, I mean, I was completely up-leveling my life, you know, and people in PMG were noticing, like, they're like, the words you're using are different. The way you approach problems are different you've created a consulting company and you're, you're, you're killing it, right? Like you're doing all these amazing things. And so, you know, again, it's, I think it's in the nature of humans and also in medicine, this whole see one, do one, teach one. It's this idea of mentorship and mentorship and coaching are very different and people don't realize that. Um, so then people, what they were doing, is like, just tell me what to do, right? That's a very mentorship type of relationship where there's an authority figure that, um, has the answers. And then there is, um, you know, the person who needs the answers that is seeking the answer, right? Like somebody who's more attending than you or whatever it may be. Right. Um, and I was like, you know, they're like, where are you finding these jobs? And I go, I don't find them. I create them. And that, that way of speaking is normal in my brain, but it's not normal to most people. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, I don't find opportunities. I create my, my own opportunities. And they were like, what? They're like, well, can, can you hire me? And I'm like, no, I can teach you how to do it, you know, um, but it's not mentorship. I'm going to teach you how to be your own mentor. Right. And I always tell everybody, my mentor is me in five years. She's, she knows everything. She, she knows everything that I'm going to be doing right now. She knows like how, how much I stress about problems. I ask myself in five years, is this going to be a problem in five years when I'm where I need to be? Am I going to be stressed out right now that my husband did not load the dishwasher how I want it to be loaded, right? Whatever, right? Or that, you know, somebody at work talked to me in a way, right? Or that I didn't get this one opportunity right now. I applied for this opportunity. I didn't get it. I was the five year, is my five year self really going to care about that, right? And it doesn't mean to diminish what I'm going through now, but it really puts in perspective. Like it reminds me where I'm going. It's kind of like if you were going to like the store, right? And say a light is out, right? And they have to do a detour. You don't sit there and go, well, that's going to go back home. No, you're like, oh, wait, okay, well, how am I still going to get to the store? Like, I'm going to make a right here. And then, oh, I know this other street, right? You're still focused on the destination. And I think that's what coaching does. Is it helps you keep focus on the destination. And that's different than mentorship. Mentorship means you want to get to the destination of where that person is. I don't want to, co I don't want to mentor people to, to do exactly what I did. They, they're brilliant and they're going to do things that are even better than what I did. Right. Or they're going to do things that are more like, they all have different passions and different lenses of life. Right. Why would I make their world smaller, you know, by mentoring them. Right. And so, so I started like, you know, I was like, okay, let me play around with the idea. I don't know if I really want to commit to coaching, like coaching individuals. I love showing up with my coach, but I don't know if I'm going to like it from being the other side. Um, and so I started coaching people. The minute I told people I was starting to coach, I was, you know, I, I had all my clients that I needed. And then what I found that I was doing because I'm a natural community leader, right? I was coaching all these people and I found that there were normal, like regular themes, right? 
And I was like, oh, you know, you should reach out to this person. Let me connect you. Right. So basically my clients were like kind of forming their own community. And I was like, why am I, that's so much more work for everybody. Why don't I just make a community coaching program that takes all of these high level problems. And so to answer your question, there are themes, you know, we all are unique. We're all trying to get to different places. Right. But there are themes. And I think no matter what the theme really is, I think the, the rate limiting step for us to really like grow beyond our destination career, right. To grow beyond that is one owning our own success. So my first step of my program is ownership, own hership, right. Ownership. And I found that we, we don't own our success when we're still struggling and spending a lot of time on 12 main things. Um, and I won't go through all of them right now, but like things like people pleasing or fear of not being liked, right. Or fear of failure, right. Or struggling with confidence. Like we, we know we have confidence because we got to where we are, but maintaining that confidence is harder and people don't realize that. And they forget how they got to where they are to maintain that. Right. Um, or, you know, struggles with identity. Like we take things so personally, especially at work because we, it hits like our moral compass in some way, right? It hits our core, right? Um, and usually that's because we don't ever like actually nourish and grow the other parts of our life. We're only really focused on money and career. So anyways, in my first phase of my program, I go through all of the um, aspects of owning your, um, your success. And that's the first step. After you start to learn how to own your success, I mean, that stuff still keeps coming up all the time, and, but you just learn how to recognize it and you, and, and you get through it faster. Okay. Um, but once you get to that point, you start to have more capacity. You stop thinking about all of these thoughts of quitting and you stop thinking about, am I good enough? Am I, you know, is this person not going to like me? And, um, you know, all of the things, right. Um, it's not just imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon. It's way more than that. And I have the 12 tenants on my website and you guys can always look at it. But, um, once you have a little bit more capacity, then what I do is I teach people how to grow. And so my second phase is called equity and growth. And we, and we dial in, we start to like, look at all the avenues that we can grow our life. And I, and I teach my clients how to scale their life to be as big as their career. I think that's the biggest problem is that people only focus on money and career and they forget the other parts of our life, right? Which is our romantic relationships and our relationships with our friends, family, and community and our health and our spirituality, um, and, um, our romance, right? So like all of that is part of us. Right. And so, um, we really dial in on that. For example, this this next month, what we're doing on equity and growth is we're going to be talking about like protecting profit. Like, how do you really protect profit? You know, and um, I have a really interesting take on that with coaching and also with like from a feminist aspect. Um, and then another talk we're doing is with a CPA who's also a coach to really reframe our thoughts around taxes, right? And I think that's really really important, right? And so um, so we just go we dive deeper and figure out what's really stopping us from growing now that we have more capacity. And then I have a third level that once you have enough capacity, then we start really focusing on you building your legacy. And, um, and so it's really, really fun to see these women go through that. And I mean, I've had women do such amazing things. They get such amazing results, but the first amazing result that they see is that they actually start living their life. They actually enjoy their life and they stop ruminating about quitting. And again, I'm all about people quitting whatever job that doesn't serve them anymore. But when I say quitting, I mean like, like quitting on themselves, quitting on their dreams, right? We always pivot in life and that's okay, but I don't want them to quit on themselves, right? And so it's really, really fun to see them grow. Scaling your life to make it as big as your career is something that I'm never going to forget, Dr. Savory. Thank you for sharing that. You talked about how important it is to scale the life, the friendships, the relationships, the romance. And along those lines, a term called midlife crisis is thrown around like like a joke. So is there a difference between midlife crisis? Is there really something called midlife crisis? And how is that different from midlife awareness? And where does burnout play a role in all of this equation? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I think when I started coaching, um, because I was asking myself questions like, is this all I'm going to do my whole life? Um, I mean, I love medicine. I still practice medicine. Um, I never wanted to leave medicine. Right? I just was ready to do more. And um, a lot of people in my circles at that time were like, oh, you're burnt out. Mm-hmm. You know, 
I was like, no, really, like, do you think like if there's ever anything like bigger that you want to do? And they're like, what's bigger than being a doctor? Right. Um, and they're like, you're just burnt out. You're burnt out. And I think where that came from, I never really identified with burnout. Um, and I know it's a real thing. I really have a lot of respect for it, but I didn't personally think I was burnt out. Um, but what I think happens is that our vocabulary for this phase of our life is so limited. We only know burnout because for a lot of reasons, one is we're told that burnout is our problem, our fault in medicine, because it serves the institutions, right? And it kind of shuts us up like, oh yeah, of course you're burnt out. You know, medicine has a high rate of burnout. Now be quiet and go see your next patient and finish your charts on time, right? That's exactly how it's treated, right? And it's not treated seriously. Like, oh, for burnout, go and do some yoga, right? Like that's not the treatment of burnout. And burnout is systemic. There's a systemic portion of it. Yes, I think there's a point where we contribute to our own burnout, but I also think that a lot of it has to do with circumstances that are systemic as well. Um, so I think burnout is a little different. Burnout is someone who actually really wants to quit, right? They just don't want to give any more. They're done with it. They're, they're, they're on fumes, like in your gas tank, right? They're on fumes and they're put putting around, right? And they're about to overheat. You know, it's a little bit different. Um, but that's not where I was at. I was at where I believe is mid-career crisis. Mid-career crisis is a very normal stage of development for successful people. Again, this is something that affects successful people. So things like asking yourself, is this all I'm going to do my whole life? Um, what else is out there? What is my purpose, right? What kind of impact am I going to have, right? All of those questions you might be asking yourself in different ways, but those kinds of questions are not burnout. That is a time in your life where you are an expert in mastering where you're at and your brain is freaking bored and it is ready to start growing. But we've been told as doctors and lawyers and engineers and all these people that you've, you've achieved the top thing. So if you want to keep growing, go to a conference and learn about the next, um, you know, research that's coming out, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about evolving beyond what your identity is right now, right? It's like, okay, what else do I want to do, right? I mean, I, I don't think that we live this life to do, just do one thing. I think we are dynamic people, you know? And it doesn't have to be something completely opposite. It doesn't have to be like, I'm a doctor and now I'm going to go open up an art gallery. It doesn't have to be that either, right? Like, but you can start, <laughs> you know, it's almost like what I tell my clients, it's almost like when you're walking up a flight of stairs, right? Every flight of stairs has a break in it at some point right? I feel like being a doctor is a break. And then you could decide, do you want to go up the stairs? If you don't, there's no drama. You can stand at that break forever, right? Or if you're like, mm, I don't want to be up here anymore. I want to go back down. That's okay too. There's no drama in that. You can go back down the stairs, right? You could decide, but it's just, a, it's just a resting point. It's just a point of um, tremendous success. And it's okay to stay there for a while or forever. That's okay. You know, but I didn't understand mid-career crisis was a thing. Um, there wasn't a lot written on it. Um, I found two studies on it, but those studies, I was like, oh my gosh, they're studying me, right? Midlife crisis, midlife awareness is different because there's an actual physiologic component to it. In women, it's usually at the time of menopause and that's around the age of 51, 52 um, in the fifth decade. mid career crisis in successful women that have multiple like, degrees and whatnot usually happens between the age of 35 to like 50. So it could start really early again, premature ovarian failure and menopause can happen also at 35. Right. So it's a little confusing, but there's a real trigger, which is a hormone change. Right. And then there's lots of thoughts about identity. And then when you add the societal component to it, which is like, okay, you've, been, you've defined yourself as a woman for those that define as, you know, that identify as women by, um, a lot of, a lot of the hormone based things or thoughts that you have about being a woman. So things like, you know, having, having kids or choosing not to have kids. And then the backlash of both of those things, right? If you have kids and you have too many kids, right. What's wrong with you? If you don't have kids, what the heck is wrong with you? Right. Like, and like, just like where you are, like, I call it social proprioception. Like, where are you in, in society? Right. Like what, what role are you playing? And all of a sudden you hit 50 and you're like, what's defining me right now as a woman, you know? And I think that that's like a lot of like the questions. And so a lot of the questions that midlife awareness people ask are like, what, what am I, you know, what's my identity? Who am I now? They start, they still ask about impact, but they're really like looking at impact for the rest of their life because they think that their life is like half over. Right. Um, 
And so men, men present a little differently where mid-career crisis and midlife awareness happen at the same time at the age of 50 for them in general. Um, and men think about mid-career crisis a little differently in general. They're more thinking of like, you know, what, what am I going to do with the rest of the, of the career to maximize it for the next 15 years, right? And so they're thinking about money and um, success in that way, right? And being set for the rest of their life. Women are thinking about their value and their impact in their community and in, in their industries, right? It's a little bit different. Um, but all of that was through my own growth and learning this. Nobody was there giving me a podcast or a lecture like I am right now. Like nobody was there doing that, you know? Um, and so it's really fun to take people through that process and be like, it's okay, right? Like we had our attendings and we had our teachers holding our hand through the process a little bit. And that's what I do for my clients. Like, Hey, it's okay. You're just ready. You're ready to like make life even more great. Like there's nothing wrong here. Let's do it. Right. And it is uncomfortable. That's why they call it growing pains. It is really uncomfortable, but you know, what's more uncomfortable staying stagnant in a place that you don't want to be. So I just remind them it's going to be uncomfortable either way. So just choose your discomfort and, and let's go. As a physician, I think you have given me a diagnosis that I have that I did not know, mid-career crisis. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, I do a webinar. Uh, I think my next one might be, I think it's like May 20th, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. I Don't quote me on that. I'll have to figure out, look back at my calendar with my team. But I do actually a whole webinar on diagnosing yourself. And then I have the treatment plans there. So that way they know, they know what they need to do next. That that whole webinar that takes 45 minutes took me five years to figure out. So if I can help anybody save time and, you know, not be so uncomfortable through that, like I, I would love that because my whole mission in life is really to create more, to create more follower, create more leaders, not followers. And that creates a lot of independence and like really putting the autonomy back into them, right? Like you don't have to look for, at me for the answers. I can help you find the answers within yourself because ultimately you're the expert on your own life, right? So um, it's been fun. And all of my clients have different things that they do and it's just so neat. And um, this time around in my 1% Women's Club, which is my coaching program, we have three women who, a sports nephrologist, a woman who does sports medicine for elite teams and a sports psychiatrist that works with elite athletes like uh, professional players, right? Like, so it's so interesting to see. And then they built their little micro community, right? And they're like, okay, let's help each other, right? And so it's so fun to help people dream and to see that they're helping each other dream and think outside the box. So it's like really, really fun. So, I mean, all my clients are very, very different. They all have different like thoughts and, and feelings. And it's so nice to see all of them in that same space growing with each other. Because the other thing that happens when you're on this like growth plan is like when like, I don't know if you, if you had this, cause I know you shared with me that you have a leadership coach. When you start getting into coaching and you start thinking differently, you start to realize how different you are than the circles and that you were normally hanging out with. And then it could feel really lonely. The things that they complain about are just not complaints you have anymore. The things that they worry about are just different things than you worry about for the most part anymore. Right. And so then it could feel even more icky and, and, and isolating. And as humans, we don't like to feel isolated. So sometimes we limit our own growth so we can still fit in with the crowd, right? So this community gives them like their coaching best friends and then they have their best friend that they've always had, right? So like, they don't have to like, they don't have to choose or be really, really uncomfortable, you know? So, um, so that's really, really awesome that I'm giving them that community um, and they're giving it to each other. This is fascinating. I think we can go on and on with this conversation for next several hours. Oh my goodness. Everything that you said hits so close to home yeah. that when we do realize we have mid-career crisis and start going along a different path and find a coach and find ourselves isolated, that is when the uneasiness starts creeping in. Am I crazy? Am I doing something that I should not be doing? Why am I making it so hard for myself? Why am I taking on so much more while everybody else around me thinks I should not? Why do I have so much on yeah. my plate? So those self-doubts start creeping in and then you are trying to fit in when ideally you should be flying high and making your own path. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that stage. It's just that people don't recognize it. And they, and it's easier just to put a lid on it and be like, Oh, well, I make X number of dollars. I'm already a doctor. I should just be happy with this. Right. Yes. Um, and that's when people start doing things that are just, you know, really going against their values and, and not growing. And that's really, really uncomfortable, but, um, but yeah. Yeah. So if it's something that speaks to you and feel free to reach out, 
to either one of us. Um, and yeah, and I have a group coaching program. The next one starts July 1st. And so we're enrolling now for that. And so you can always message me, but yeah, I'd love awesome. to see everybody there. Sounds great. Dr. Savory, thank you for joining us on Inspirar today. Is there a parting message that you would like to share with our listeners today? Yeah. Um, gosh, I feel like I've shared so much. I think that, um, you know, it's, you know, you've already done, you're, you're probably living your wildest dreams and that's okay to recognize and celebrate. And I hope you're celebrating it. I really hope you're celebrating your success for everybody that's listening. Um, and when you do that, you know, think about what your next step is. And the next step could be just staying where you're at and that's fine, but be intentional with it. And, um, I think the one thing that I didn't, I wish somebody would have like, I mean, somebody did tell me this, but I wish I would have listened to it before is really like hire a coach, like all elite athletes, CEOs, they all have coaches and there's a reason for it. It helps your brain be more productive. And I think, especially for really successful people, um, I think it just helps them even be sharper than they already are. Um, it's really to enhance what's already working. Um, it's not like therapy, it's not psychiatry. Um, it's, it's neither one of those things. And so I think a lot of people, including myself, I had a lot of strong feelings of what coaching was in the past. Um, until I actually tried it and I tried it as like a lot, a last ditch effort, you know? So my goal, my, my, my advice to you is own where you're at, celebrate it. Right. And then when you're ready to grow, consider hiring a coach. And it's different than like having a group of friends that you guys are all keeping each other accountable. It's very, very different. So just consider, be curious about it, hire a coach. And, um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Sounds great. Thank you, Dr. Savory. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone, for listening in to Inspinar today. Let's reconnect with the real world. Let's reconnect with health, joy, and efficiency. Let's reconnect with what truly matters. Let's ungrip devices and grip life. I will see you next time. All right, take care.